Hi, welcome to Whiskey and Wool. My name is Shannon. As I realized last time I recorded that I did not say my name or who I am. Uh, let me just make sure we're recording. Yep, we are. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's been it's been a while. Um, yeah, I'm Whiskey and Wool on Instagram and on Ravelry. On Instagram, there are four O's in wool. Um, the one without extra O's was taken. So I have so much to share with you today. Uh, this might be a little bit long of an episode, but I hope it'll be exciting and fun. I thought about dividing it in two, but I think I'm just going to power through and see how it goes. Uh, I think it will work in an, you know, with around an hour, hour and a half at the most. So first off, I am not going to do a whiskey chat. I normally, if you're new here, I normally start my episodes with a whiskey or gin chat. Um, and I have, oh, I have two delicious gins to try with you. I haven't even opened them yet. I've been waiting. Um, but uh, I'm not going to do that today because I went to New Jersey Sheep and Wool on a whim this morning. And I'm going to sp spend the time that I would normally talk about uh, a whiskey, do a whiskey chat, I'm going, or a gin chat. I will uh, instead chat with you about. New Jersey sheep and wool. So I'm going to start there. I know, you know, you might be noticing that I have a finished object. So hang in there. I'm going to talk about my knitting and my spinning. I have a couple exciting things to talk about with spinning with you, um, as well as some new cast ons. So I hope you'll stick around uh, for this episode and um, I hope you enjoy. So I'm going to tell you about New Jersey Sheep and Wool and I'm going to overlay some video clips. I took a ton of video clips this morning. Um, so first off, let me just start with that uh, New Jersey. So New Jersey, if you're not familiar, maybe you don't live in the US or you don't live on the East Coast and you have no clue. Um, New Jersey is a fairly small state. It takes about two hours to drive the short way across East West and it takes about Oh, sorry, it's probably more like an hour to drive east-west, um, hour and a half. It takes about three hours to drive from north-south, the north-south route. New Jersey. I don't know if I said where I'm from. I'm from northern New Jersey in the U.S. <laughs> um, I live just outside of New York City. We can see the city from the city line um, from certain vantage points in our town. Um, and it's beautiful. It's I live in a very suburban rural-ish area not as rural as where I went today though um the New Jersey sheep and wool festival like so for me the reason why I was explaining how small New Jersey is is just so that you understand um where it was exactly so just it's interest. New Jersey is a fairly interesting state uh and in that Near Philadelphia and near New York, there are some pretty intense suburbs. Um, but other than that, there aren't, you know, it's it's countryside. It's beautiful, green, rolling hills and pastures with, you know, dotted with tiny towns. And it's, 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 it's very, very nice. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the country that gets a bad rap because of the urban areas um, and not just the urban areas, uh, but also because of the refineries and things that we have in New Jersey um, that, you know, make, make gasoline. But you know, here's a secret about the refineries in New Jersey, our gas prices are low. <laughs> That's a bonus to um, having, you know, sacrificing some land for, that purpose. It's nice. I paid three sixty nine, I think, this morning to fill up my tank, and we get our gas pumped. <laughs> so sorry, not to branch off into a, you know, the pros of living in New Jersey, but uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> there are pros. I'm sure there are pros to every state. Um, 
But okay, anyway, New Jersey sheep and wool is in the center of the state. It's pro I would say it's almost dead center. So for me to get there, because I'm on the far north corner, um, on northeast corner, I would say, it took me about an hour and a half to get down to Hunterton County Fairgrounds, where the Sheep and Wool Festival is held. It's been there for dozens of years. I just never went because it was far and I didn't really know a lot about it. But my spinning godmother, Sarah of Green Goat Ranch, has been an exhibitor there for, I don't know, quite a while. I didn't ask her. Probably five, I would think, years or so. Um, so I, knowing I was going to miss Rhinebeck and I was going to miss seeing so many of my friends and the vendors that I know and love at Rhinebeck, I thought it would be fun to go to New Jersey Sheep and Wool. And um, Sarah posted on Instagram that she was going to be there this weekend. And I resolved to go just a couple days ago. I was like, mm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. I'm so glad I did. It was spectacular. It was so, so beautiful. Um, it reminded me of old Rhinebeck. <laughs> like just a lot of farmers, a lot of like 4-H kids that um, it's so heartwarming to see them with the animals and knowing that they, many of them will become future farmers and continue to produce this wooly goodness that we love to craft with. And yeah, oh, so nice. So a lot of the vendors were local farmers or New Jersey based farmers or just outside of the New Jersey area. So there was one vendor from Maine and sadly, I didn't think circle back. I meant to circle back to chat with them a little bit and pick up a couple of things, but um, I got this really nice brochure um, from going in. Oh, it's the 20, so it's been going on 27 years. It's the 27th annual um, Fiber Festival. It's compared to Rhinebeck, if you're familiar with Rhinebeck, it's fairly small. There were, um, Five, a total of five barns. Two of the barns were dedicated to animals. And it's just, it's so nice to like, when I arrived and I got out of my car, just like hearing the sheep in the background. So nice. And it for, you know, I got there about 9.45. It opened at 9 a.m. Closes at 5 and it was pretty empty. So I was like pretty chuffed. I was like, great, gonna have plenty of time to talk. Um, Sarah's booth was set up right next to the fleece uh, sale. Like many sheep and wool festivals, there's a fleece sale. And uh, so I went straight into the fleece sale. I've been toying with the idea of buying a fleece. I'm not sure I'm ready <laughs> to do that, but you know, I think I need some more equipment, which put a pin in that. We'll come back to that later. And yeah, so I walked through that. That was really cool. There must be several big Jacob sheep farmers here in New Jersey. I have some clips also that you'll probably see, or maybe you've already seen of Jacob sheep animals there. And I should have filmed this other, um, some of the sheep that I filmed, I don't really know what the breed was. There was lots of Jacob. There was a whole, whole like pro probably about half a barns full of Jacob sheep. Um, they're really interesting sheep. They have um, horns and they, the um, coat is, if that's the right word. I'm not even sure if that's the right wor word. They're sort of patchy colored. Um, browns, blacks mixed with cream colors. So pretty, pretty interesting. Like there were some use with their babies, which I know I have clips of, um, for you to see. And yeah, so there were a lot of Jacob fleeces in the fleece sale. I sort of have had this idea that I want to buy the blackest, darkest black fleece that I can find because I don't really want to buy a white fleece because I don't have any interest in dyeing it and um, I don't really want to knit with white fleece so 
I mean, for me, it always comes back to what do I want to knit with? What do I want to make into, you know, something for my home or one of my children's homes or family's homes or for me or one of them to wear? So I thought black would be fun. I know it won't be black, black like the sweater that I'm wearing, but it would be, you know, probably like a nice charcoal gray. I'm just looking around to see if I see any and I don't. Um, <laughs> so, or like an off black, which would be really pretty. So I didn't buy any. I just, I still think I need more training. <laughs> I need to figure, I need to be able to experiment a bit. So I went from there right over to Sarah's booth and we had a lovely chat. We were trying to figure out the last time we saw each other in person. It's been so long, but I, I, I feel connected with her because of Instagram and being able to connect that way. Um, I was so sad that when I figured out that I wasn't going to be able to go to Rhinebeck um, and because I knew Sarah was going to exhibit for the first time in one of the um, external events to Rhinebeck, leading up to Rhinebeck on the Friday before, I just, it's not going to work for me. It's not going to work for me because, if you're new here, you may not know this, I have a, a granddaughter and she's turning two on that weekend. So I will be going to Maine to spend the weekend with her and my sons and oh, it's going to be so great. I'm so excited about that. Um, but I, I knew I wasn't going to go to Rhinebeck, so I wanted to make sure I saw Sarah. I, I will show you. I bought some fiber from her. I'm going to show you all the purchases at the end. So from the barn that Sarah was in, I walked around a little bit and went over to see the animals. And um, there's a sh there was a show ring, too. There, there was competition. Uh, for the young farmers and I'm sure the more um, uh, mature farmers as well and yeah I went through the rest of the barns and I picked up some beautiful items it started to get a little more crowded as I made my way over oh I must 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 mention that I saw hugs from shrugs Mary of Hugs from Shrugs. Um, another person that I've connected with through this channel. And um, I just want to see. I know she gave me a card. I picked up plenty of cards from people. Is this it? Yes. So what Mary does, she has a very interesting um, business where they hand dye yarn and sell the hand dyed yarn and then that helps 100% um, of their sales go to their charity. So it's a charity that she calls it a charity with a side hustle. Um, so it goes to their charity where they help families whose um, children uh, are suffering from cancer. So she helps um, local area hospitals as well as um, hospitals like regional I should say, not necessarily local. Um, and yeah, it's really, it's a very, it's heartwarming, beautiful thing that she does. Um, so yeah, I just want to give her a plug and I saw her, um, we chatted for a little bit too. She had, um, been able to expand some of her businesses because of some of the things that I talked about here on this channel. And that is just the best it's the best making making connections for people just so so awesome all right so let me show you what i purchased i um there were many new to me vendors and um i yeah i i didn't as you know if you've been here a while i'm not um I'm intentionally buying, having a low buy year, but I knew if I had gone to Rhinebeck, I would have had, I would have purchased, um, I would have probably spent a few hundred dollars on fiber and fiber related things. So I wanted to let myself buy whatever I wanted. And I knew for a fact that I wanted to support Sarah. Um, and pick up some things from her. I was actually very keen to know whether or not she was going to have another advent calendar. Um, she had released some uh, 
she's not really calling them advents. Uh, yes, no, but they could really be anything. I'm using the term loosely. It doesn't have to have religious purposes. It could just be, you know, a countdown calendar. But we, um, in knitting and yarn purchasing, have become accustomed to calling them advents. So they're really just a countdown calendar. So last year I had bought an eight year, eight eight day countdown calendar from Sarah of this beautiful bright colored Rambouillet. Um, that I spun in a rainbow order and then I made a sweater a hoodie for my granddaughter so I'm gonna put that on screen now so you can see it um, if you want to know more about the spin and how I investigated the spin go back to my advent uh, my um, vlogmas from last December and you'll see the spin if you're interested in seeing the spin and then I think around March or so, I went once I knew they were moving to Maine. I went ahead and whipped up um, the rainbow hoodie that I made for her. I have enough of the yarn left over to make her a second hoodie when she outgrows this one. So she'll have a rainbow hoodie for quite some time. But anyway, I bought some more Rambouillet from because that it is such a beautiful fiber to spend from Sarah. Um, so she's been making what she calls plying pairs. Let me take these out because I think you'll be able to see them. I want you to at least see um, them partway. I was drawn to very autumnal colors. Um, she, her booth is bright and colorful and she had uh, some autumnal colors as well as some very bright colorful colors and a couple neutrals. Um, but I just thought these were gorgeous. Look at that. Look at that. So she calls these plying pairs. It's four ounces, two ounces, and two ounces. And the idea is that you could do a combo spin where you make one bobbin this color or two bobbins this color and two bobbins this. So whatever you're doing, equal, equal. And then you're plying them together, um, which is a cool, cool concept. I have bought some plying pairs from her before. Um, I just hadn't, um, I haven't spun them yet. I, my spinning wheel right now is empty, so I may spin her, the plying pairs I bought from her during Tour de Fleece. Um, this one is called, uh, I'm going to just put it up close so you can see. I think you can imagine what that second word is, um, but it's based on the Witcher series. If you watch the Witcher, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So I bought this set and then I bought this set from her as well. Oh my goodness, you really can't see the colors that way. This is another one based on um, the mine train in Fantasyland. Sarah does a lot of Disney colors, so if you're a Disney fan, um, you might be interested in that. But look at these. And her idea with this was that you could also do plying pairs. So these are all two ounce braids, all Rambouillet. gorgeous 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 so I don't know what I'm gonna do I bought them with the intention of like hey this would be you know this is enough fiber for me to make yarn for a sweater or a big project um, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do whether I'm gonna combine these together in some way or like I could easily do a gradient with them yeah I don't know I don't know. I'm going to let them gel um, and I'll figure it out. Before I get too far, oh, I already emptied it. Um, I took for a test drive. This is a new acquisition. Um, it's Hohi Locatelli's bag company. It's her Santa Fe bag. It was on pre-order in this beautiful purple suede. I love this freaking thing. It doesn't stand up by itself. It's very floppy, but when you put stuff in it, it's totally, totally fine. So I wandered through and I found these lovely ladies. The company is called Wildwood Farms Alpaca, and they sell um, alpaca fiber, alpaca yarn, and also many, many crochet items. And of course I have grandbaby on the mind. So I purchased this really super cute snowman hat 
It's so adorable. I can't wait to see it on her. I hope she loves it. It is crocheted and they also were selling patterns. So I guess if you saw something they were making, they were selling the patterns too. Um, I just know I have you know, I was happy to support them and I have so many things in my queue to make that I, I thought this would, I mean, yeah, it was very, very affordable. Um, so a super lovely um, company. They also had, they, I almost bought um, a crochet rabbit. Oh my gosh, it was so cute. But I realized it was because I had recently watched um, Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of the, the the film, but I recently watched a new film. I'm gonna put it on screen, the name, because I'm gonna look it up when I'm editing. And uh, there was a rabbit. It featured a rabbit. Um, it was, was it live action? It was live action, but with the animated, um, uh, like dolls and stuff like that and rabbit. And I think the only reason I liked the rabbit was because of that film. And I was like, oh, you know, she has enough toys. It seems to me. Okay, I only made one other purchase. There were, I was actually thinking before I went because I've been on this DK weight sock journey. I thought I might pick up some DK weight skeins because, you know, sometimes you see or you connect with a vendor and you think, you know, you want to support them, but your, your your budget doesn't allow for you to buy like a sweater's quantity. So I thought, I'll, buy, I'll pick up some single, I'll allow myself to pick up some single skeins of DK weight. But I ended up like, by the time, like I was actually, um, especially thinking about, um, I think it's Vita Lifestyle, Victoria Vita Lifestyle. She lives on Staten Island, which isn't too far from me. She goes to this every year. I was thinking about her yarn. I was thinking about Chelsea Knits yarn, um, Christina of Chelsea Knits or Chelsea Yarns. I was thinking about her yarn and I was thinking about Chertsey Cat who lives in PA. So um, Christina lives in Red Bank too, like in the in, not too far from Sarah. But... By the time I got around to their booths, their booths were really crowded and I couldn't get in. And I just thought to myself, and they were, you know, very, very busy, like dealing with lots of customers. So I thought to myself, it's fine. I don't need any more yarn. It's totally fine. So I ended up not purchasing any yarn, but I did buy some more fiber. I found a booth um, that pretty interesting woman. Her name is uh, Julie and the company is called Julie's hand spun yarn so I picked up two braids from her of BFL so this was one I was just really interested in the color combo I know it's more spring like so I may save it for a, a spring spin really really reasonable so that was the other thing I really loved look at and look at this one I bought this one too also very spring like um, they're both a hundred percent BFL both four ounce braids so again probably won't go together but could be really interesting three plies um with the three colors i could play around with that with like um mix or blend of them so yeah i picked these up as well um yeah, so I ended up not buying any DK. I did stand outside all three of those booths and look lovingly in <laughs> and just think, wow, I can't get in. And I thought I would circle back, but I had an accident, which I'm gonna uh, talk to you about in a minute. Um, the last purchase I bought was this beautiful ceramic mug. There was only one ceramic artist. There was a second person who had ceramics, but I don't know if they were handmade. Um, but I thought this was really well priced and it's beautiful. Um, this is about the size I need for my morning coffee. She wrote on the, it's the, it's the company is called the Rogue Artisans. Tall mugs are perfect for hot chocolate. I'm going to use it for coffee. It would be good for hot chocolate, but she had a few really, really adorable ceramic mugs. Um, I just have a really big collection of ceramic mugs. So I wanted to um, come home with one and I oh, can't wait to use this tomorrow morning. 
really, really looking forward to that. That is everything I bought. and So I good. I'm so happy I went. It really, really reminded me of Rhinebeck when I was younger and um, just a lot of like sheepy energy and a lot of like makers there that were, it was a lot of farm yarn, right? And a lot of farm quality, like farm um, high quality, of course. Like where you really had this feeling you're buying directly from the farmer or from the maker, which I absolutely love. It was really, really great to see. And um, anything I'm regretting, I picked up a few business cards, anything I'm regretting. I do, I do often have regrets and look backs where I'm like, crap, I wish I went back to <laughs> check out what they have. Um, I will, you know, just look them up online and make some purchases. Um, so yeah, so the reason I ended up leaving, so I started to flag, my energy was flagging around noon. So I went to go get lunch and I ended up like spilling it all over my pants. <laughs> I, I ate a gyro, it was delicious. I had some homemade lemonade, so, so good. And I just dripped the gyro at the end. I was done eating and it just went all over my pants and I was like, okay. I think it's time to go. <laughs> so I didn't end up going back through some of the um, area areas that I had that I had gone through uh, and intended to return to. It was actually Julie. She had some really beautiful bats, but I prefer to, I mean, they were gorgeous and they were so reasonably priced, which that was another thing about the whole festival was that the pricing so much better so much better than what you can get at Rhinebeck um, to me anyway or like what I'm used to seeing it was interesting too like I started to think like I mean I haven't been to Vogue in two years I haven't been there since 2020 January of 2020 it's now February 2022 going to this festival kind of gave me pause about going to Vogue like maybe I don't really want to go to Vogue this year I don't know I'm gonna think about it it's super easy for me to go um because it's so close I live so close to the city but I'm gonna I'm gonna think that through a little bit more we'll talk more about that when it gets closer also today was freaking beautiful it's the it's coming on late afternoon right now um and uh yeah really really warm out now it was a little cool chilly we're having like our chilly chillier nights with very hot days and i don't mind it i don't mind it at all um but it is a little warm to be wearing a sweater all right let's jump into the knitting i um finished my linen daily pullover. So this is the third daily pullover by Paula Pereira that I have made. I made uh, one out of the recommended yarn, which was, um, or is rather, the linen quill that Pearl Soho makes. So um, the daily pullover by Paula Pereira is sold by Pearl Soho. So she um, designed the pattern for them to sell. And uh, I made, I went right from that into a second one made out of superwash wool just because I was curious to see a more drapey yarn in it in that um, pattern. And I have a bunch of superwash sweater quantities, so I was curious to see how it knit up. It worked out fine. I've been wearing that sweater more often than this one. Um, because it's a little warmer than this one. And then I made this one, which is made out of uh, field linen, also from Pearl Soho in the Raven Black color. Here it is on the skein. I bought uh, four skeins and I have nearly a full skein left. Camera was freaking out there for a moment. Um, yeah, interesting knit. Linen is not wool. <laughs> It does not act like wool. Um, the interesting thing to me when I was blocking it, I don't know if you're going to be able to see. You see how my sleeve is shaped? When I was knitting it, I was almost with a balloon sleeve, like going in. It was very wide going into this like closed cuff because I went down a needle size. You would never know that now. I mean, look at it. 
It just goes straight now, which this was the sleeve I wanted. When I blocked it, all of that bloom, that poof going into the cuff disappeared. The sweater also grew in length. I don't think it grew wider, but I could easily block it out that way. Um, I'll pop a picture on screen. Um, the neck got bigger too. I'm wearing a little tank top underneath because it is quite see-through, this fabric. Um, I absolutely love the detail. I don't really think you can see it, but there's a really cute detail at the V. Uh, I ended up knitting the sweater a needle size larger than the pattern calls for and then I ended up knitting the smallest size to get the equivalent of like a size three or four um, just because of the way my gauge worked. I don't know if I'll make another linen sweater anytime soon. I mean, I'm happy to have this one. It's a really versatile color. I'll be able to wear the heck out of it. I have worn the heck out of it. Um, a couple things that I don't really like about it was mainly like the ends don't, you know, they don't stick to each other like um, wool does. So they don't behave. So they pop out all the time. Um, and yeah, I think it's just going to continue to grow. It did soften a little bit in the soak. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's just the way linen is. And I adore linen. Like, I wear linen clothes all summer long because they are, I wear linen t-shirts, linen pants, linen skirts, because they're super cool in the very, very hot weather. To me, like, I find them cooler than cotton. I think you can get thinner fabric with linen than you can with cotton. Which, by the way, I got a new um, spinning wheel charm and they are actually spinning linen, not wool. There's spinning linen is a little bit uh, different than spinning wool. But yeah, I had to bust it out and wear it today. Um, yeah, when you spin linen, you have a a spindle that holds the cloth or a rod or something that holds the the fiber, and then you spin, you wet spin. It's a completely different process. I've watched some pretty detailed <laughs> videos on it to just kind of get a feel for what, not that I'm going to spend linen and don't think. I realized one of the things I was thinking this morning as I was getting ready to go to this festival was like how much I really love wool. I just really, really, really love wool. I have loved wool almost my entire life. Certainly since I moved to the East Coast because I grew up on the West Coast and moved here when I was, um, a late teenager like I moved here for college essentially never went back my whole family's on this coast too so my um, parents moved and my sisters moved one of them moved back to the moved I shouldn't say back she moved to she did go back to California for a little while and then she moved to Ohio so hi if you're watching <laughs> I don't think any of one in my family watches my daughter-in-law sometimes but no one else really watches okay yeah so i finished this finished my daily pullover i'm taking a break from daily pull pull pullovers you will be relieved i do have another a fourth one planned where i want to um hold two strands together a um surrey and a uh, wool together to knit a pullover um Oh my gosh, I'm getting a hot flash. <laughs> TMI, right? Uh, all right, so let me talk about what Martha's wearing. Hi, Martha. Martha is my mannequin. She is my size. I have built her out to be my size so that it is easy for me to pop things on and understand how they may fit on me. So I do that with my sewing and with my knitting. Um, mostly I'm knitting. I don't sew all that much these days. So Martha is wearing my almost finished Vair pullover by Gundren Johnson, Johnston, sorry. It is in this book here. The, that is the pattern right there on the cover. The Shetland Trader book three. You can buy it on Amazon or maybe your local yarn shop if you um, have a local yarn shop that has a good library. Um, yeah, I 
was looking for, you know, I saw this, I saw this pattern made by a few different people on Instagram. It popped up in my, in my feed and, uh, most significant probably is, is, uh, Jackie of Caddy Jack's Knits. And, um, it's, piqued my interest and I thought I was actually gonna make I got the book and um thought I would make the the um Mayfair I think it's called hang on I'm just... so it's got that razor shell pattern all over it and if you watch Amy Pelko on the meaningful stitch she made this sweater she made the Mayfair I got a little nervous and actually seeing Amy's made me think that I was probably doing the right thing to not make. I was worried that the fabric, this all over razor shell fabric would be a little too drapey and squishy for me. And when it seemed to me that Amy's was a little drapey and squishy. So I thought, you know, I'm okay with it being drapey here. But I think I want a little more structure on top. So I flipped over to the Vare instead and I put together a palette of yarns that I had um, on hand because I'm all about using up my stash this year and I'm doing pretty okay, pretty good I think. So the main colored yarn that you're seeing here is a hand spun yarn that I made from comb top from John Arbin. So this is a John Arbin color called English Mustard and their base is called Viola. The Viola base from John Arbin is a DK weight. I spun it to be a fingering weight. So um, John Arbin Textiles does fair specials and stuff and I had heard about him, about that mill, about his mill. I don't even know, like probably like four or five years ago. And then when I went to Edinburgh Yarn Festival in 2019, I met him and picked up some fiber. Or I didn't pick up fiber, I picked up yarn. I didn't spin yet, I wasn't spinning when I went. That was in March. I didn't learn to spin until April of 2019. Um, and then he had some show specials. They do an anniversary show every summer, just around Tour de Fleece, at, like in June. And I bought some fiber at that point, and that was when I picked this up, um, along with some other fiber of his. So you'll be seeing more of the fiber, of the um, fiber that I purchased over the last couple years from John Arb. And I didn't buy any this year. This was the first year in three years that I have not bought fiber. So, yeah, I had spun. I think about 1200 yards and this pattern calls for about that amount and I think maybe a little bit less than 1200 yards of the main color and I'm only on the second skein I have a third full skein I should have known better like I don't know why patterns do that like I mean I guess maybe of the if I use the yarn that was um, suggested maybe I would have used that amount but I know myself like I for fingering weight yarn or even sport weight I'm a full sweater takes me about 1200 yards a thousand to 1200 yards somewhere in there and this has a significant amount of other colors so I should have should have realized but I didn't <laughs> um, anyway the yarns are, the rest of the yarns are yarns that I had on hand, a um, bunch of single skeins. Um, what you're seeing are two loop fiber yarns. Um, one is called Body and the other one is is um, Loop Fiber Studio. They're like these marled yarns. I'm sorry, I put the skeins away so I don't have the skeins anymore. The blue, the lighter blue here is um, Jameson and Sons Spindrift, which is the recommended yarn for the pattern. The pink is a indie dyer that no longer dyes. The light pink. The bright pink is La Bien Aimé. The colorway sorry. And um, yeah, that's it. That's all of them. I did use, compared to the pattern, I used an extra color. They did four colors. I used five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so they only used, well, five, they used five colors total, including the main color. I used six colors total. 
So when I got to the top, the color work, I did a like a mix and match. I was I didn't follow what the pattern recommended. Um, I instead just kind of knit whatever, and I think it's fine. Uh, I do have to do the neckband. I think I'm going to do a turtleneck like um, in this picture. They do give you an option of doing a balloon sleeve or straight sleeve. I chose straight. And uh, yeah, I think that's all I can say about it. I really like always when I'm getting towards the end of a sweater, I really can't wait to block it and see how the fabric looks. I think I'm going to get some growth here because these are garter um, garter rows basically garter garter knit stitches so I think I'll get some growth in the length usually garter opens up a bit and you know a little growth up here too which is perfect like if it gets as long as this t-shirt I I won't be mad about it <laughs> it's fine if it stays this way but yeah that is so that is uh you know, the next whip that I'll probably have done. Although I am knitting on tiny needles. I'm knitting on size three, US size three, which for you non-US folks, I don't, I mean, I should get used to the millimeters because they make more sense than our needle sizes. Uh, US three is a 3.25 um, millimeter needle. So it's, they're quite small. Um, and I believe I go down to a, um, a 275 for the neck so that'll that'll take a while um, to do it to do like eight inches of a of a rib knit fun but it'll be worth it right because it'll it'll look great okay my other I have three new cast ons three but I'm going to show you one that will be familiar if you watched last um, last couple episodes I am also working on a Lace and Fade Boxy by Hohi Locatelli. This is um, a, a lace and no fade. <laughs> Again, working from some deep stash. This is what I thought might be my Rhinebeck sweater if I were to go. Um, because this yarn I purchased at Rhinebeck in 2018. It is by Julie Aslan. It is such a luxurious, soft, soft yarn. It feels so good on the hands. Uh, it is called Fino. I, I think I already said that. But it is 75% merino, 15% cashmere, and 10% silk. And the colorway name is road to Rhinebeck and the idea is that it is um, the color of the pavement with the wet leaves so it rains so much in upstate New York <laughs> um, with wet leaves um, so it's got these speckles of red and orange gold and brown and green in it so pretty really love it and it's perfect because this pattern needs a very drapey yarn and I have been looking for, waiting for the right pattern to use this yarn for um, because of the drape. So I don't often do drapey knits. I make more structured knits, more like this. So um, yeah, this was perfect. I, as soon as I saw the pattern and I saw how elegant and beautiful it looked on Hohi when she um, released the pattern a couple months ago, about a month ago, I guess, um, a couple episodes ago of her episodes. If you watch her journals, I just fell in love. I was like, this is the pattern for this yarn. Um, and yeah, I ended up purchasing a warm toned gray. I really think I could have gone any direction, but I felt really strongly about wanting a warm toned gray with the sweater for the mohair um, section so I went to neighborhood fiber co because I knew she she has a broad uh, range of colors and I figured I would find um, a yarn that I liked and she's close by she's in Baltimore Maryland which isn't too too far from me and this is the colorway Federal Hill and it is uh, her loft base which is a mohair silk uh, you only need one skein of the mohair. In fact, I'm done knitting the mohair. Yay. 
It wasn't too bad um, because it is just in like 12 row sections and it, you know, it's just a, it's concentration. And then you've got these bajillion stitches, like 400 stitches that you're knitting in the round um, in a lace pattern. And then it alternates with these really long sections of stockinette. Um, but the beauty of a mindless stockinette on a million stitches is that it makes really great knitting for when I'm in a meeting or if I'm watching a show that I want to pay close attention to really, really easy. So I am um, just a, a handful of rows away from beginning the rib, the rib bottom, and then I'll do the sleeves and this will be done. This may surpass, I might finish it before I finish this just because of the mindless quality of what I have left to do. But yeah, this is this is really nice. I have a second one of these planned that I am planning to do for the Hohi knit along, fall knit along, which she does every fall. I haven't participated in her knit along in quite a while, um, but I talked about it last time. It's going to be a bright colored one that I'm using a mini skein set for. And I have a, a full skein plus a mini skein set that all goes together and I just happen to have mohair from another vendor that everything goes. So more about that probably next time. I wanted to get this done to the point where I was done with the body and I'm on the sleeves before I cast that one on. So that should happen in the next few days, I think, and this certainly this week where I'll be able to cast on the bright one, which will be really fun. I'm so excited to see how that will look. If you're wondering about this adorable, very, very cute bag, it is from um, the Fat Squirrel, Amy of the Fat Squirrel, Fat Squirrel Fibers. She makes project bags. This is a, uh, I think she calls it a large wedge, which is fine for me for a sweater. Um, this is my favorite size bag. I use it all the time, but it is so cute. It has otters, a mama otter and a baby otter and a sea anemone and a crab. But I really, really love the colors. I love this red violet with turquoise. <laughs> Those are the colors that I, color combo I love. All new cast ons now. You ready? How am I doing? It's getting late but I don't think I'll be too long. I've been knitting the Drea, Ren Re Drea Renee Knits Rhinebeck sweater. Wasn't planning to, wasn't planning to. I thought I might sit it out, but I had the yarn on hand. I had all the yarn I needed um, with the exception of one more spin cycle color. So talked about this last time. I showed you my colors, how I came about picking what I was doing. So this is my sweater so far. I love how this spin cycle color I have kind of arranges itself in a sunset in like the way a sunset looks or a sunrise looks with that gradient from that warm orangey gold up through the, the shades of blue. I opted to not do a textured yarn in the zigzag. Instead, I went right into the spin cycle yarn, which I think works just fine. Um, somebody, a couple people <laughs> said to me, oh, you could just say it's textured, but I don't think I need to. I, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on in this um, contrast color here, which will be here at the neck. And then also on the, um, each sleeve. So each uh, sleeve will end in this type of pattern. So I'm just gonna show it to you real close so you can see. This is a La Bien Aime color, a sport weight yarn. Um, it is the Calcifer colorway, which is based on a character from a Miziaki film. Um, I'll pop it on screen if I recall. I, have, I do have a picture of Calcifer. And then the spin cycle color is um, Siren Song, which is a special colorway for the Mermaid's Pearl. Here's a full skein of it. So it is those, um, as I was saying, like those sunset colors, gold, oranges, and shades of blue, like especially turquoise. The main color is some um, wool that I have had on hand for quite some time called um, 
by Rama. So it's a Norwegian wool. Uh, it was an accidental purchase. I was intending to buy green and I ended up buying like this pretty denim blue and I just kept it because I thought, eh, it's good. It's great color. I'll use it for something. So it is PT2 Rama colorway 4124. Um, as always, all of the yarn information will be uh, linked, or not linked, oh yeah, linked to Ravelry. A link to my Ravelry. I list everything on Ravelry and then link it there. But you can also just Google if you don't, if you're not on Ravelry, you can just Google the yarn and you'll find some local makers or local sellers by you. So yeah, this has been so fun. It is so addictive. I'm on the... Um, the stretch of it where you're just doing the flex uh, in the whole body and uh, yeah it's been moving along if I didn't have so many other things on the needle I'd probably be done with the body by now <laughs> I'm continuing my sock journey I hope this isn't too boring for um, regular viewers but I am continuing my DK sock journey I am knitting DK socks um, for my adult children and their significant others um, if they have them so it ends up being five because I have one son who is single do you know anyone <laughs> let's match make um, yeah so I have one single boy and two boys that are partnered so um, the sons and their partners are all getting socks this is for actually my oldest so I've already knit a pair for the two younger ones and uh, this is for my oldest son it is a Ching color way called Pika based on Pikachu so they were all Pokemon fans and it is so so soft I really really love it the pattern I'm knitting is the Drea Renee everyday sock pattern it is made for fingering weight so I've re-engineered it re-engineered it for DK it's been quite an adventure but I've worked out all the numbers now for all the sizes that I need to make um yeah it's just really easy breezy knit so fast I've got it down pat now um and I am I'm on the leg I'm almost done with this sock and uh, I tend to I don't know about you but when I do that that heel transition I'm really focused and I crank my way through it and then I get to the leg and I sort of kick back and ease up on the knitting but you can actually see I, I was in the middle of a row so um, this is the knit that gets carried around with me all the time so I expect to have this pair of socks done um, next week so it's this is just a really beautiful butter yellow with flecks of black and red um to signify pikachu if you know if you know um and it is her classic dk which i don't think she makes anymore i don't think she uses this this yarn anymore if she has it it'll it's probably yarn she's phasing out but it's a 75 25 superwash merino nylon blend um, so it's perfect for socks, really great for socks, unless you want a nylon free sock. Then I think the Superwash BFL that I used for the other socks. And you're, you're going to see more of that Superwash BFL um, from Corner of Craft coming up, Chromatic Yarns coming up, because um, I have two more socks to make um, with that. One less whip. This was something that I... Um, on a whim cast on this is um yeah, just a start this is actually a uh sleeveless top but i'm calling it a vest um i've been pretty captivated by the whole like the fashion look of a button down blouse with a vest over it for fall i'm worried i'm not going to get this done in time um, to wear <laughs> this fall, but I just thought, you know, I'm a knitter. I'm not going to buy a vest. I'm going to knit a vest. So, um, I cast on the Rota sleeveless top. I don't remember the designer's name, but I'll have it on screen here. I have had about 700 yards of this beautiful, this is another John Arbin, but hand spun by me where I bought the 
fiber, this beautiful chocolatey brown with like shades of violet and red violet in it. It is so pretty. I love it so much. It ended up being this beautiful soft heather. I don't remember what the um, fiber is. It's wool um, and it's British wool. But I don't know, I don't remember exactly what the blend is. I think it's like Exmoor Blueface with some other things. Uh, every It'll be in the show notes. Um, or I don't think I'll put it on screen because I think it's quite, quite long. But I'll put it in the show notes. So I've had about, I spun this. I didn't buy enough to make a sweater's quantity. So I've, ha I've had about 700 yards of it. So it's perfect for a vest. And so I just searched for a vest pattern that I thought I would really like. And I just was really interested in this highly textured, um, hopefully you're seeing it. Let me see if I fold it and it won't be so, you won't see so many holes. It's got like these little mini cables and some yarn overs that create this like mesh. I really, really love it. I think that's the front side. It's just a concentration knit. This is a concentration knit. So um, I'm I'm in the midst of shaping the armhole. I have a few more rows to go and then I'll finish that. And then what you do, so this is top down, and then what I do is come back and cast on the front off of these shoulders and start shaping the neck. I think it has, I think it's a kind of a boat neck. I'm not sure. I put a picture on screen though for you so you'll be able to see. I have a lot I'm trying to keep in my head to talk with you about. Um, but yeah, oh, it smells so good. It's sheepy wool. I really love it. I think I'm going to love wearing this. Yeah, so we'll see. See where I get with that. It's, it has not been getting as much attention as I think it needs. <laughs> but maybe I can remedy that as I cast off some of these other things that I've been working on. All right, I have a little more to talk with you about. I have some spinning. So I have finished spinning a sweater's quantity since I last spoke with you. So I had a viewer ask me about talking a little bit more about my fiber prep, particularly when I'm taking like various skein, or, um, braids or fiber that's not necessarily the same colors and I'm blending it together. So I did a little chat about that, which you're going to watch right now. And when you come back, I'm going to show you the finished yarn. So I thought I would share with you um, some of the fiber prep that I'm going to be doing for this next uh, spin. I uh, purchased these, actually all three of these braids um, towards the end of 2020. I actually think I got these in early, earlier this year, like January or February, maybe February. And you know, this was some fleece some fiber that I just bought because I like them and I wasn't really thinking about what I was going to make with them um it's only after the fact that I have sort of taken some time to just look and think about you know what what might be good what might be good to make with these and um because I have such a huge quantity of look at that black so pretty um, since I have such a big quantity of single braids, I often look for um, ways to combine them uh, together. And for me, the first step to that is to um, match by fiber type. Um, so these two from Akari Yarns are Porth, 100% Porth. And they are two different colors, but they both have a lot of white in the base. So um, I think I can make these work. Plus these, this blue and this sort of rusty color are very complementary to each other. And um, because each of the braids are four ounces, I, that's the color, Cafe, and this color is called Bear With Me. Um, because they're both four ounces, I know that is barely enough for me to make a sweater. So in order to get to the amount, I think 10 ounces is probably the right amount for me to make a sweater. 
um, quantity, but, uh, you know, yarn or fiber isn't often sold in two ounce increments. It's sold in four ounce increments or hundred grams. So I'm going to throw in this, um, four ounces of fin. So this is wool that I bought from, um, uh, Rhinebeck in 2021. I just really liked it. It is some natural black and natural white put together undyed um and i was curious i've been curious about how this would spin for some time i've never spun thin wool this is from solitude wool and it's um they do a shave them to, they participate in shave them to save them um and such they're a really great company i've bought a lot of yarn from them in the past just really solid um, fiber and yarn supplier um, and I believe they are based yeah in Virginia so they often go to Maryland too this is very high quality fin wool um, it does have a little bit of veggie matter you can see right there which I'll be pulling those out as I spin um, as I see them they'll also wash out um, so I'm not I'm extremely concerned about them but I did think that because of the colors that are happening there, that this would be a nice um, addition to create a 12 ounce spin that will ultimately be a sweater's quantity. So you can see it's three very different colors. Um, the reason that I'm going, I'm going to put the fin with the porth is because according to my field guide to fleece, which is an abbreviated guide um, to the very big um, fleece <laughs> guide for uh, spinners and knitters. So in looking at this, the the um, qualities of fin and the qualities of Polworth are very similar. So they should spin together quite nicely. Uh, and fin does have a pretty broad category, but I mean, um, micron count, but this feels very, very soft. I think I've got some very nice quality and I think it will, um, blend very nicely with the pull worth. So I'm not worried about that at all. So that's how, that's my first step. Usually, um, trying to, uh, group fibers that are similar and will, um, you know, have similar structure when it comes to creating a yarn. The second part is to then determine what am I going to spin in terms of am I going to spend a fingering weight, a DK weight, a sport weight, somewhere in there. That's usually what I spin unless I'm spinning for a very specific project. I mostly knit fingering to sport weight and occasional DK. So I want fingering weight because I know I'm going to be able to find a pattern that will work for me with that. So fingering weight, and since I aim for, my spinning wheel is set up to make about um, four ounces on its biggest bobbin, on its jumbo bobbins from me plying, from when I'm plying, I know I need to create six two ounce bobbins that will then become three four ounce skeins. Um, that should average out to be about anywhere from 12 to 1400 yards. I've spun Polworth before. I'm usually, I'm, it's a long fiber, generally speaking, so medium to long. So I think, and so is Finn. So I think I'll be able to spin this quite thin. I don't think I'm going to, I think I'll be on the higher end of the yardage. I'll probably be um, somewhere in the 14 to 1500 range on yardage, which is about right. So the next step is to then divide each of the, um, in this case, two braids. And in this case, just, this is just fiber looped back and forth in the bag. Um, so this is combed top. They're all combed top, commercially combed top. Um, actually, I'm not sure that's commercially combed, but these two definitely are. And then hand dyed. This one is undyed. So the next thing is to divide each of them by six and then I will have an equal amount I'll do pretty much equal amount in terms of weight so um, I'll be unbraiding these two and um, looking at the way they're painted and then figuring out how to split them I'll show you that in a minute um, and this this is pretty straightforward this just gets divided into six so it'll be divided into six by quantity by weight um, we're getting we're, I want to get as close to the same amount of weight per 
um, bobbin as possible and that will help me get more consistency in terms of color and in terms of the fiber blend. Okay, I have my six balls of fin. I need to weigh them, but uh, what I'll do is just pull from one. There's not, this. these are very consistent. All six of those balls are gonna spin identical, so I'm not really concerned. Um, here, this is going to be a little more tricksy. Um, on top is the blue and pink braid, and then beneath it is the rust and black or blue black, it's kind of a blue black, look at that. Braid, um, and so it looks like the pink blue braid is kind of random. I don't really see a pattern in there. Um, and I, I think the same with this one, with the, the rust and, and I'm just gonna call it the rust braid. Um, yeah, so what I'll do um, is divide these. So I want to, I need six pieces. So I'll probably divide them in half and then I'll divide those halves in half. And then I will, um, that'll give me four. And then I'll probably just pull off um, some segments to create. Um, actually, I might do that before. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. I, this one I feel, the blue one I think I can divide any which way. So I'll probably divide it in half first um, by um, pulling it in half. I'll probably divide it in half here, like pulling it apart here like this, and then strip it down to three parts. That's what I'll do. I'll probably do the same with this one because I think the colors are pretty consistent throughout. It's not like one side is uh, a lot of rust and the other side's a lot of blue. It's just there, it's splattered throughout. One thing to note though, um, with braids like this that are hand painted, where I have these massive splotches, that color is not going to be that intense. These will very much get diluted by all the white that's on either side of them and surrounding them. The more I strip this down, so the thinner I make this fiber, the more, um, the, the uh, less intense the color. So I'm more likely to get intensity of color if I leave it together, if I strip it, cut it this way instead of this way. And to be um, perfectly clear, I won't be cutting at all. I'm gonna be pulling um, pulling the fibers apart. Um, so yeah, I will show you the final results. Okay, almost done. I um, I did what I had said. I, I pulled apart um, in half crosswise and now lengthwise I am splitting each of these fat strips into three. And that's how I got three balls. I still have to weigh them all. I haven't weighed them, but I'm going to um, distribute the weight among them so that each of the bobbins has the uh, pretty much the same weight within a gram or two. Um, and that will help me use up all the fiber without having to um, do a lot of hand winding at the end when I'm putting together the very last skein. Um, the next step after I get my, you know, so say like this, this, and this, these three parts, these three balls right here will be one bobbin. I then would need, will need to prep this one bobbin um, for how I'm gonna spin it. So I won't be spinning this first, then this, then this. I'm gonna do a mixture. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what type of mixture I'm gonna do. Um, I'm, I tend to do kind of a random, so I might like decide, oh, each of these are gonna be divided into three parts, for example. And then I'll spin them in an order. And then on the next bobbin, I'll change it up. I'll spin, I'll do six parts or I'll do four parts um, just so that I get, um, it's kind of a quasi fractal spin. So if you know how to fractal spin, if you know how to prep fiber for fractal spinning, you could completely do a fractal setup and it would be fine. Um, I, I don't know, I guess I'm a little more loosey-goosey with my fractal spins, but the idea is that you get 
sometimes on the when the two plies come together sometimes this will match sometimes this will match sometimes that will match each other and then we'll get this matching that this matching that that matching that so there'll be like a nice melange of color and it should give me very consistent color as well um with the fine with between all three skeins okay you are back so here, actually, let me show you. These two skeins are a little damp still. I fi just finished um, finished them up this this morning. But this is the finished yarn. This might be among my favorite hand spun that I've made. It is so so pretty. I love how the braids kind of came together and created this. Um, this like they it just reminds me of river stones it is so pretty it's got a little bit of blue some amber gold there you can see the blue and some some very pale pale dusty pink in it as well as a lot of this sort of zebra black white stuff going on um you might be able to see it a little bit better on these skeins can you see it? It's so pretty. I really, really love it. Uh, I have a little bit more information, I would say, about the the wool, the the um, blending of these. I think you'll be able to see it more on this. So the fin yarn or fiber that I was spinning, though it had been combed, it had been sent through a carter, I think. The fibers, the Polworth was very, all lined up. So everything went in one direction. The fin was sort of jumbled in that um, strip. It didn't look like it unless you looked very close. But what ended up happening was that I had quite a few neps so like you can see there like some little like natural neps that occurred from the jumbling of the fibers so it was really noticeable while i was spinning it and i think after soaking it the the um pullworth poofed like it always does it kind of just like you know bounces when you soak it um so i I mean, I think what will happen is that in the sections of the fabric, like I think you can really see a lot of it right there. I think in the fabric, there's going to be moments that are going to have these little neps poking through, which I don't, I don't mind. I, it's going to kind of change the character of the fabric for me. It's going to make it a little more rustic looking instead of sleek and smooth. I think that's fine. I'll just um, be thinking hard about what. Um, you know what project I want to make with this but I did end up with um, I believe it's a sweaters quantity um, I had yeah I had 12 ounces so I should have ended up I didn't calculate all the yardage out yet um, but wow I really really love the way the colors blended I think the colors just blended beautifully um, yeah, so, so nice. And oh, I just love it. I love that that brown, those moments of like that toffee color with the blue and then the black. It's just, they're just spectacular. So yeah, so brand new spin off my spinning wheel. And now I need to think about what else, what to spin next. I don't have anything in mind. Um, I'm just gonna pull out my fiber and, and check it out and I don't know maybe one of these new ones that I got so yeah that is spinning I completely forgot while I was filming early yesterday because it's now morning I'm having coffee in my new mug so good I'm not quite pulled together in terms of yeah anyway just a little interlude here. I wanted to talk about the science behind the myth. So this is a segment that I introduced around episode seven of this year. And it didn't seem to me there was interest. So I stopped paying attention to it. I created a form and had people put their questions on it. 
So um, apologies for the people that put questions that actually responded to the form after um, a little while. I just stopped looking to see if there were responses. So yes, there's been responses. So I want to um, address a couple of these. And I think what I'm going to do with this segment is just put it in here and it won't be an every episode thing. It'll just be a, an occasional episode thing. So the idea of it was that we would explore maybe some myths of knitting or fiber or yarn and just explore them and see if there's science behind it, if there's any science that backs up the myth. So the question that was posed that I'm going to uh, take talk about this time is one that I've been really wanting to talk about, actually, and I'm glad someone else brought it up. Um, it is this idea that purl stitches take more yarn than knit stitches. So I dug deep into science on this. Um, I want to just briefly talk about science of fabric and yarn technology. So yarn and fabric technologies are quite old. They're about 10,000 years old. <laughs> but scientific evaluation of things didn't really happen until the 20th century. That was when um, scientists started to explore the science and technology, the science of technology in many, many, you know, aspects of our society. And scientific evaluation of fabric, yarn, and fiber began around the 1950s and went through about the 1980s. It was a very finite um, well to <laughs> dig into. So once they figured out the science behind the technology of yarn and fabric, there wasn't very much more to look at. Um, so a lot of the data, it's, it's true, but it's old. Um, so it's from the 1970s, 1980s, uh, so to speak. So uh, I looked at a lot of this old technology just to understand, uh, or this old science to understand, was there any evidence that doing a reverse stockinette stitch, which means you would purl every, every row or every round if you're knitting in the round, versus doing a regular stockinette stitch, which means you're knitting every round, would the reverse stockinette use more yarn? And there's absolutely no evidence of this. Um, so the answer is, I want to just, I want to frame this in a way because this is, this has been talked about on another channel by a very well-known, very uh, popular designer. So I want to phrase this in a way that um, doesn't say, you know, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about, because there is some, some information that show that demonstrates that where this myth came from, or where this idea that maybe doing reverse stockinette purling would use more yarn than knitting. Um, and it comes from continental knitters, mostly. So continental knitters, when they create their knit stitch, so if you're not a continental knitter or if you don't know the difference between English and continental knitting, um, English knitters will hold the, uh, have some knitting right here. English knitters will hold the yarn, tension the yarn in their right hand. Continental knitters tension the yarn in their left hand. And the, the, you may also know them as picker versus thrower. So the continental knitters are pickers, meaning they're going in and they're like, they, they do something with their, they do a movement with their wrist where English knitters do a movement with their entire arm. So they may, they do this where continental knitters do this. If you're an English knitter, when you're throwing your yarn, whether you're throwing it for a knit stitch or a purl stitch, you're not using more yarn to make that stitch. If you are, if it's because you have a tension problem when you're purling. Um, but English knitters tend not to have the tensioning problems that continental knitters do. Continental knitters are notorious for absolutely hating purling, and that's because they the way that they do the stitch, because they're picking it, they're kind of twisting their wrist and um, picking up the yarn and pulling it through. I mean, there's several ways to purl. Um, the, they tension the purl stitch in a slightly different way than they do the knit stitch. And in the way that they're tensioning it, when they create that stitch, they are in fact using more yarn to create the stitch. 
But when they snug it up on their needle, when they give it a tug or whatever they do to, um, to tension the stitch on the, on the working needle, if they do it correctly, if they do it in such a way that the tension of the loop, whether they're knitting or purling, ends up being exactly the same, then ultimately they're not using more yarn in the finished stitch. <laughs> so they may use more yarn in the creation of the stitch, but not in the finished stitch. So that's, I think, where the myth came from, this idea that perhaps you're using more yarn to purl. If ultimately in your finished object, if you used more yarn to purl, then you have a tension problem. You're not tensioning the yarn properly. You're not snugging it up properly on the needle after you're done making the stitch. So, um, and you will know you have a tensioning problem if you get rowing out, if you're knitting flat and you're knitting stockinette or reverse stockinette and you're doing knit a row, purl a row, knit a row, purl a row, you will get rowing out. Rowing out, and you'll be able to see that very clearly on the reverse stockinette side of the fabric. Um, and I'll show you a picture. I don't have anything. I, d I don't have this problem. I don't row out. My tension between purling and knitting is the same. I've been a long, long time knitter. Um, I think it's something, tension problems come from either new knitters or um, people that are switching the knitting type that they're doing. So if you go from English to continental or continental to English, you may have a little bit of a tensioning problem. So whether or not, I guess the bottom line is what I'm, what I'm saying is that whether or not you have, you use more yarn when you purl versus when you knit in your finished fabric really depends on your tension. If you're a continental knitter, when you're doing the purl stitch, you are in fact using a tiny bit more yarn than when you do a knit stitch, but when you snug it up on the needle, on the working needle, it should be exactly the same. I hope that helps. I'm curious what else you wanna know about. I do have one other, someone else responded. Um, so I will talk about that in an upcoming episode. If there's other things that you wanna hear about, uh, go ahead and fill out the form that I've linked below in the description box. Back to your regular program. Spinning. Um, the last thing I have to show is I did get a little bit of sash positions that were not, that's another reason why I'm glad I didn't buy any yarn today. These were not necessarily planned, just kind of like, oh, I think I really, really need to have those. So I um, shopped Ching Fibers pre-order uh, with her latest line, her latest like collection. And these are really, these are just have granddaughter written all over them for me, but I bought all DK. So I bought two skeins of DK, just like beautiful rainbow color, which two skeins should be plenty for a sweater for my granddaughter. But oh my God, are they not just amazing? So yeah, these will be some baby sweater some toddler size sweater. And I also got two skeins of this beautiful yarn, um, also from Ching. This is, uh, oh, I should tell you the names. Oh, this is Fizzwiz, which what a great name. So I bought two skeins of this because I had to have a skein of this in, for me, for socks, um, to make socks with. Um, and I ended up buying, her dashing DK, it's a hundred percent superwash merino. Um, so I bought two skeins, thinking I'll make something for Julie, like maybe a hat uh, or maybe some socks and a pair of socks for me. Um, this color, this really beautiful neony rainbow, is called Flying Saucer. Yeah. I just loved it. I, she made a whole bunch of really beautiful, like 10 or 12, maybe eight or 10 colors um, that I just was drooling over. And then I realized like, oh, I could buy DK um, for socks because I don't have very much DK. <laughs> I don't have very much in my stash. I Every skein I have, single skein of DK that I have in my stash, 
I'm making, I have plans for. Um, so this was like a good something to have. The last yarn purchase that I have, yeah, I um, am planning to make a sweater from Lana Magazine. This is Lana Magazine from, I don't know, I think it's an issue or two ago. I really want to make the Funfetti by Sylvia Cherry Watts. And it is set up for, it's a DK weight sweater set up for Sylvia Watts Cherry. Sorry, not Cherry Watts, Watts Cherry. Um, it is meant to be knit out of West Wool um, DK. And I thought to myself, okay, I love West Wool. I've knit with it. But wouldn't it be really fun to make this sweater in a more drapey uh, fabric so that it's not so like stiff on you um, like the Red Rifle Kid? Um, and I also thought it would be really fun to color it in using like a real 70s vibe. So I, I started to research like yarn that I could buy here. I mean... Look, Stephen and Penelope, if you've ever bought from them, they ship so fast. You get it, like, practically the next day. Like, it comes to me very, very quickly. Um, but I thought, you know, I always try to buy yarn more local, like yarn from at least a U.S. maker if I'm not buying it more locally to me. And I've been really wanting to try... <laughs> Sorry, this is going to be a lot of crinkling right now. I really wanted to try Lamb and Kid wool. This, I totally blame Caitlin from Caddy Jacks for this because when I saw them last year at Cake Palooza, they had gone to Wool and Folk and saw Lamb and Kid. Lamb and Kid is a fairly new company. I think it's a couple years old. And Caitlin said to me, I said, Caitlin, I asked Caitlin what she had her eye on. I was chatting with her and I was like, what are you looking to get? Like, or did, what did you see that you really loved? And she just was like, oh my God, I saw Lamb and Kid and I practically blew my whole entire Rhinebeck budget there at that booth. And I was like, well, you know, I always want to knit what you're knitting. So tell me about it. And she told me about this yarn. It's called Todd and it is a yak cashmere blend, 65 yak, 35 cashmere. And I've been intrigued, but I just was you know, trying not to purchase too much. And since we're closing on the end of the year in terms of knits and purchasing, I decided to splurge for this sweater. And I've been um, buying from the monthly matinee where you get uh, a pretty good discount, about 25% off if you buy from the matinee. And uh, yeah, I'm collecting based on these color palettes that I saw that are influenced by the 70s. So I have two colors so far. So I've got these two. Um, this one is called K, this turquoise color, and this like kind of not very keyed up orange. It's kind of a really mid-toned orange. It doesn't look so mid-toned on screen, but trust me, it's a little softer than what you're seeing, is the colorway Kaftan. Um, so I got these two for a start on the palette. So I, these will be two main colors. You need three skeins of, um, four color and three colors. And then you get a fourth color that is the, uh, collar and cuffs. So I, um, yeah, I just need one more, I need four more skeins and I'll have enough to cast on so this will be I'm thinking this will be like a New Year's uh, Christmas to New Year's cast on for me because I'm going to take my time picking out the next two colors I think I'm going to um, buy either my third color will be like in the gold goldenrod area or perhaps a cream color or brown and then I, depending on what color I pick for that, I may, um, I, I'll, I'll choose my fourth color for the collar and cuffs. But um, I'm actually not veering that far from what the pattern was made out of. It was just using West Knits instead of um, 
the lamb and kid colors, but I think I'm really gonna love knitting with this. It feels so soft. I think the drape is gonna be spectacular. Sorry, I'm just like flipping through trying to find that picture again. I should have flagged it because it's got the blue, it's got the orange, and it's got the, it's got gold. I just think I really want brown. So if I don't buy brown for the third color, I'm, I'm probably gonna do brown um, color and cuffs. I think it'll look really pretty. I'm excited about this. That is all I got for you today. I think it's a lot. Um, yeah, we're probably gonna be, probably be about an hour 20 maybe hour 25. There are some beautiful little clips of the end of summer around here. I, our tree, the tree that I stare at outside my living room window has not yet turned. So it's not yet fall until that turn, that tree turns. It is so beautiful when it turns. So maybe by the next time I broadcast or um, make an episode, like I'm a TV station broadcast, who do I think I am? Yeah, the next time I make an episode, it may have started to turn, but I will definitely be putting in some footage of that because it is so pretty. But lately, I have seen some deer running around on the property, and I have also seen the um, end of summer hummingbird. And I don't know if I put this in the beginning or the front or back, but I, or at the end, but I also saw a hummingbird moth, which they're really interesting looking so I have a little footage of that um I didn't realize that they're a bit of a garden pest like they feed on tomatoes I think tomato plants so but they're really really cool looking they look like little miniature hummingbirds um, but they're a little furry instead of feathery I think pretty cool so I all that footage is in as well as any remaining footage that I might have from New York sheep or New Jersey sheep and wool I hope you're doing well. I hope that you are enjoying the change of weather wherever you are and that you are looking forward to all the things, the fall weather, the holidays, all those, all those lovely, lovely things. For myself, I've been going absolutely mad <laughs> with the beginning of the new school year. Um, I'm a university administrator and professor and I am drinking from a fire hose right now. It is more than I can handle and I was so grateful to escape all of that and have like a really nice um, morning and afternoon. Morning at the Sheep and Wool, afternoon with you here talking about it and yeah um, I think that is all I have for you and I will see you next time. I should be back in two weeks with a fun-filled episode um, and all of that. Have a great couple of weeks and I will see you again soon. Mm -hmm.